This conference will now be recorded. Okay, it's just about 10 o'clock um, on Wednesday, May 27th, um, the last Wednesday of Preservation Month. And um, thank you all again for joining us uh, once again on a Wednesday morning. Uh, we hope you're all having a good day and where you are, it's sunny. The sun's finally starting to come out here in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, and we're looking forward to another really great conversation today. So um, today is hard to believe that it's episode nine for our preservation conversations. And uh, we're very, very grateful to be joined by um, three amazing preservation architects who are gonna give us a little bit of a glimpse inside uh, what they do, um, their role with projects and preservation and some projects they've worked on. So um, I'm really excited and I've been looking forward to today's conversation for, for the past few weeks. So um, before we get started, um, just a few, there you go, just a few uh, welcome reminders. Um, please, when you join, please uh, mute your phones. Um, it just helps keep some background noise down so people, everybody can hear. Um, if during the course of the conversation you have any questions, um, please feel, the, feel free to send them using the chat feature um, in your GoToMeeting control panel. It looks like a little conversation bubble. Um, you can submit questions throughout the course of the next hour, um, but we've reserved some time at the end of the hour um, to, uh, to answer the questions. And if for some reason we don't, get, uh, we don't answer your question, um, I'll save the chat log and we'll do our best to um, to, uh, to get your answer to you. And also just a disclaimer, this, this, con this uh, conversation is being recorded and will be up on our website and our YouTube channel. So, And then uh, just again, um, the reason that Preservation Massachusetts decided to start these conversations was just a way to positively connect, communicate, uh, share ideas and questions and suggestions about historic preservation. Um, it's come a long way from when we did our first pop-up office hour um, at the very end of March uh, when everything was uh, very uncertain and everything was happening. So we're uh, pleased that it's kind of grown in attendance and, um, and substance. So uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions for future topics or sessions, um, my email will be up at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the, um, the hour and feel free to send me an email um, with feedback and any ideas. So um, as I said, today's theme is preservation architects. Uh, who are they and why do I need them? Um, we, and as I said, we are joined by three preservation architects. Um, they are also members of our, our very dedicated Preservation Massachusetts Board of Directors. And I'm so very grateful for all three of them for volunteering to take part in today's conversation. So we're being joined by Bob Score, Wendell Calso, and Scott Winkler. And um, as always, um, additionally on the call is the Preservation Massachusetts staff and also Chris Kelly from the Massachusetts Historical Commission. So if you have a question that maybe isn't necessarily on topic, but you still want to ask it, um, feel free. And we have the PM staff and Chris here to, um, to answer as well. So um, that's about it for me. And um, we're going to get started with our conversation with our great preservation architects. So, um, First up, we have Bob Score, and um, Bob is there. Yep, I see his name on there. Um, Bob, whenever you need me to advance the slide, just say um, next slide, and I'll take care of it from here. But I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Aaron. Um, so my name is Bob Score. Um, I'm an architect that I've been practicing for 30 years, um, and pretty much my whole career I've concentrated on uh, treatment and restoration of historic buildings. Um, so I, I guess one of one of uh, Aaron's requested topics is why people need us, um, and I hope I hope we're needed. Um, I think preservation architects who specialize in preservation have a few unique uh, ways they approach practice. One is certainly understanding uh, existing buildings, um, what their history is, and why they're significant, um, as well as uh, investigating and understanding existing buildings and historic buildings' uh, physical conditions and, and, and what their needs are, as well as understanding users' programmatic needs and how that relates to how the building was originally designed. Um, and then we, we sort of take all that and we work with, with users and clients um, and lead discussions um, and 
to, to identify different options for how to treat historic buildings, whether that's restoring historic materials, making modifications for accessibility, or new program uses. Um, and then we, we put all that together, and during construction, we work very closely with craftspeople um, to make sure that the, the right level of treatment and, and quality of, of, of craftsmanship um, is provided. You, you could advance, Aaron, please. So I just wanted to go through a little bit about uh, some of the projects I've worked on. Um, so this is one project that I um, started with doing uh, master plan work um, back in 2000 and then saw through construction uh, in 20, by the end of 2016. So quite a long uh, relationship. This is uh, Unity Temple in Oak Park, Illinois, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, certainly one of his master works. Um, it's a World Heritage uh, site as well as National Historic Landmark. And we started out doing an extensive master plan and condition assessment to establish uh, fundraising goals um, and identified that the, the church needed to raise about $23 million to do a full restoration of the exterior and interior as well as programmatic upgrades. Uh, it's, it's still an active Unitarian congregation. And so they had a lot of needs for bringing in uh, up-to-date audiovisual and accessibility um, and things to really make their, their church program work well, um, as well as extensive exterior concrete restoration, restoration of the stained glass and interior finishes. Uh, you could advance, please. So this is, this is the, the interior of the sanctuary. And, and we worked really closely with plasters and painters and finished conservators to, to spend probably about two years investigating the original interior finishes, um, exposing portions of the finishes because they've been overpainted many times, and then doing a lot of trial and error to figure out how to create new plaster work and new paint finishes that accurately replicated the interior finishes, um, as well as working really closely with stained glass restoration studios. They're sourcing custom glass for replacement, sourcing custom zinc canes for, for replacement of, of caning within the windows. Um, just a lot of different players, but always getting back to sort of hands-on hands -on experimentation with craft people is, is a, a big part of how I approach work. Next slide, please. This is another project that I worked on over many years. This is a Carson Curry Scott department store in Chicago designed by Louis Sullivan uh, with some of the later editions uh, by Burnham. Um, but really a, a quintessential example of Chicago school uh, skyscraper as well as work by Louis Sullivan with really ornate ornamentation. Uh, the image on your left is sort of the condition of the building when we started working on it. Um, you can see that the, the, the top story as well as the projecting cornice had been removed. Uh, that was removed and, and infilled in the 1940s, um, which was a common problem in Chicago. A lot of these terracotta cornices were starting to fail and pieces were falling to the street and people were getting killed in the city. So the city mandated either remove them or fix them. And a lot of buildings removed them. So on this project, we actually recreated all of the uh, ornamented cornice and, and top story. We did a, a hands-on survey of all of the terracotta facade um, and the windows sort of piece by piece, sounding each piece of terracotta with a mallet to figure out its condition um, and restored all of that. And then we also did extensive restoration of the bottom two floors. You can see the darker band um, that's all cast iron, one of the more ornate cast iron facades um, in the country. Um, and so we've completely dismantled that, came up with a new way to structure it and restore every piece and then put it back together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Next slide, please. So this is a detail of the cornice work that we recreated. Um, it's all recreated in glass fiber reinforced concrete and a more panelized system that cut down on the weight from what the original terracotta would have been, as well as brought in some uh, cost economy. To, to, 
generate all the ornament, we actually, instead of drawing it all, we hired a team of sculptors prior to uh, finishing the drawing for this project. And we, we worked with sculptors for a year, um, trial and error going through and, and generating all the master artwork in clay. Um, and that became really the construction documents for this work. Next slide, please. Um, this is a detail of the cast iron um, at the base of the building. So when we first started working on that part of the project, we got up close and personal, started understanding its physical condition. You can see there's a lot of corrosion and separation of, of the joints and displacement. And it was really an, an advanced state of deterioration requiring full disassembly and reassembly of the original cast iron. Next slide, please. So this is, after we, we dismantled all the cast iron, we actually rented a warehouse elsewhere in Chicago where we stripped the paint off of each individual piece of cast iron, did repairs on it, um, did uh, some very complicated industrial paint coatings. And then we dry fitted the whole system back together so we could get it back into square, do repairs, come up with all the reconnections and brackets that we would need to reassemble this from the back side, then took it all back apart, took it back to site, and put it back together again on the building. And so we were, every day we were going through at the warehouse, going through details of how to restore each individual piece, um, working with the craftspeople who were doing this. Next slide, please. This is just sort of an after shot of, of how that showed out. Next. Uh, another project I worked on was the restoration of Wrigley Field, the home of the Chicago Cubs um, in Chicago. Um, really quintessential early American baseball park. Um, this is a before shot. The, the facade had gone through many levels of, of modification over time. We did extensive historic research to figure out how it really originally looked um, and then came up with drawings and, and construction for recreating the original. Next slide, please. And so here's an after shot. You can see we, we opened up, removed all the later precast concrete cladding that was added, brought back a bunch of ornamental iron frillage, clay tile, sort of canopy roofs, and, and brought the building back to what it originally was. Next slide. Uh, another project I worked on was Roby House in Chicago, another early Frank Lloyd Wright uh, masterwork, also a World Heritage site. We did extensive interior finish restoration on this project. Next slide. And, and much, actually working with the exact same teams of conservators, painters, and plasters that we used for Unity Temple, because there was very close similarities to the finishes, went through the same year, year and a half of trial and error of replicating the plaster and paint finishes for, for the interior of the house. Um, so this is an after shot of that. We also worked with artisans to come up with custom magnesite flooring, which is a, a, a unique type of wood fiber filled concrete for the flooring on the ground floor. Also art glass restoration, light fixture restoration and reproduction, uh, all based on historic photographs and, and research. Next. Wow. Another shot of Roby House. <clears throat> Next shot, please. Um, and then just some other things. A lot of master planning work. So this was Frank Wood Wright's Pelias and West Campus out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Did a, an extensive uh, master plan doing a full history of the site, how it had changed over time, what, what was significant, what modifications were not. And coming up with a real long-term plan as well as budget for, for the overall campus. Next. And finally, um, in Elkins Park, Philadelphia, this is Temple Best Shalom by Frank Lord Wright, one of his later, almost last works, um, shortly before he died. Um, and similarly, a large master plan doing extensive condition assessment and history and, and sort of a planning guideline to, to give uh, both fundraising as well as additional research and uh, what the steps are to move forward to eventually restore this building. Next. That's it for me. Okay. Good morning. Thanks.
Thank you, Bob. Um, and, and if anyone ever has questions about Frank Lloyd Wright, um, just ask Bob for. I remember being amazed by that when um, we were talking to Bob when he joined the board. And it's like, seems like Bob has worked on every Frank Lloyd Wright <laughs> property that's out there. Um, but Bob, thank you very much. And um, now uh, we're going to move over to, um, we're gonna have uh, Wendell Calso. Um, so take it away, Wendell. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, I kind of, I, I won't repeat what Bob said in terms of kind of the overall um, role that architect, preservation architects play, um, but rather jump into a group of projects right in the Boston area, um, kind of um, to show from very small scale to um, large scale work that preservation architects that we've, we've done over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, so next. Uh, this is Old South Meeting House in Boston. Um, it has the oldest public <laughs> clock in the country. Um, and we one of one of the several projects we've done there, um, next slide, Aaron, um, was actually to um, assess the clock faces. And to uh, we found that one of the two clock faces was in very repairable condition, but the other one was so deteriorated, we ended up uh, replicating it. Um, some kind of interesting but fairly questionable work was done in the 90s um, when they was an earlier project done where they actually used masonite for the uh, minute markers on it, which obviously did not hold up very well. Um, so this was the clock, uh, what the restored clock face being lifted back into position. Um, it always helps when the mayor is part of the um, kind of opening ceremony to help with the street logistics of working in downtown Boston. Next. Um, also, the original clockworks uh, rang the bell um, that was in the Old South Meeting House. This is actually a Paul Revere bell that a donor gave because the original bell was moved in the 1870s when the congregation moved to the new Back Bay. Um, so that he uh, he purchased a Paul Revere bell that was then installed back up in the belfry, and this was when it was on display for a few months ahead of time. Next. Um, a lot of historic town halls um, exist throughout New England, and um, they're, I think, kind of as a building type that they they represent kind of a whole series of, of generations of architecture. This is the uh, town hall up in Topsfield. Uh, very little work had been done on that town hall for the last hundred years. Um, and one first challenge was is that two previous efforts had been made to restore the town hall that were turned down by town meeting. Um, so next slide so that part of our our work was to develop an idea to both address the needs of the town um, which could not be accommodated within the building itself um, and also develop a um, ability to help promote the idea so some of that work is you know it is kind of a, a promotion of restoration of the town hall um, of the idea of an addition um, so that it could pass by town meeting. I think this passed by, I think it was 13 votes. Um, the next slide. Um, and this is the uh, restored town hall with the addition um, that was constructed uh, on the building itself. Um, next slide. As this is the auditorium that was kind of a key element in the historic town hall that when they ran out of space, um, for their offices, they took over the auditorium. And so next slide. <clears throat> and this is the restored town auditorium space. So it can be back for um, for theater and, and public performances as well as for civic events. Um, next slide. Um, a lot of our universities um, throughout the Boston area um, also kind of have some of our, our signature buildings. This is Gasson Hall um, at Boston College. Um, and when it was constructed in um, 1905, uh, 1913 rather, 
it used the modern material of cast stone, basically precast concrete, which had significantly deteriorated. So it's actually not soiling on the left, but it's actually the exposed black aggregate um, that um, as the stone eroded uh, was exposed and um, there was a lot of uh, small pieces falling off of the building and the restored tower um, on the right hand side. But in between those two, the next slide, um, we had to remove the top 35 feet of the tower that it had suffered so much structural damage and essentially rebuild it from that point up. Um, the project included over 10,000 custom pieces of cast stone. Uh, next slide. Um, cast stone is very kind of interesting element. There's uh, to do large scale cast stone projects, the, the kind of the, the best fabricator that has the capacity to do it is located actually in Northern Canada. So it's interesting to go to Quebec province um, where everything, uh, we were one of the few people that spoke English in the town of Alma and to make site visits there during the fabrication uh, of the cast stone. Next. Um, and this is the restored Gasson Hall at Boston College, um, new accessible entrances to the building, um, and uh, hopefully can serve the college for another uh, century. Next slide. Um, I over at Harvard Medical School is Gordon Hall. Um, we were first asked to look at the building when they found a small piece of marble on the ground and saw some cracks and um, during the inspection found that there was um, a significant amount of marble deterioration um, on the facade of the building. The next slide. Um, so that that project, uh, it was an extensive amount of work so that from very ornamental um, carvings of marble that needed to be replaced because it had lost so much material to it. Um, you can see it being installed there. Uh, as well as major structural repairs had to be made. Uh, next slide. Um, so that that steel beam um, needed to be reinforced throughout the entire length of both of the, the two major facades. And the only sign of that deterioration was kind of cracking of the marble that was in front of it that had been deteriorated. The next slide. Um, that I think 11 out of the 12 large marble capitals um, had also um, large cracks in them so that we ended up doing large Dutchmen on the face of those 11 capitals. And those Dutchmen, I think, weighed about 2,500 pounds each. So that those were pieces of newly carved marble that were being slid into position um, and the back portion of the capitals could remain. The next slide. And so that's the restored Gordon Hall after the extensive uh, facade restoration work and repair. The next slide. Um, kind of some interesting kind of practicing in New England, um, some very interesting projects that you get involved with. This is Longfellow Bridge. This is kind of like uh, one of Bob's projects where he was involved for 15 years. I think that was about the time period that we were involved from the first HSR um, on the Longfellow Bridge to its completion uh, just over a year ago. So that was one of the earliest um, vehicular and mass transit uh, bridges in the country. Um, it had literally had um, very limited work done over the last hundred years. Um, and in hindsight, some of the work done in the 50s was probably not the exact way to work that sh the project should have been approached. Um, so that was a uh, basically a three plus year construction project to restore the bridge. Uh, all the arches um, are original arches. Most of the steel work above it um, is new, except for the uh, all the railings were restored. Next slide. 
uh, one interesting piece to work on that were the bronze doors, which had been removed from the bridge about 30 years ago and put into storage after they had been heavily damaged uh, by both vandalism and graffiti. And this is the restoration shop up in New Hampshire um, as the, the doors were start to be stripped and evaluated. Next slide. Uh, and one of the doors back in place, along with a custom uh, wall sconce um, that was uh, replicated based in bronze out of the photographs that were taken. And to both sides of the tower, you can see the um, cast post lights that were also replicated based on original drawings and early photographs. Next slide. So it is nice to see the salt and pepper shakers that had been dismantled stone by stone and rebuilt um, and the bridge that should be back in service for the next uh, 75 years is what the design life was uh, set out by uh, Mass Department of Transportation. So next slide. And the contemporary lighting that was installed underneath the bridge so that it can change colors depending on what events are happening in Boston. So thank you, Aaron. Wendell, thank you very, very much. Um, it's it's always um, amazing. The um, every time we when we get questions, especially about historic town halls, we're usually referring people to McGinley Calso because um, you know from Provincetown Sandwich. Um, I believe he did with uh, Needham Town Hall as well. Um, Wendell um, Wendell's firm has worked on um, so many wonderful restorations of historic town halls, which are just so quintessentially New England and and Massachusetts. So. Um, and also the uh, the Longfellow Bridge uh, received a Songus Award last year, um, and it was great to see that um, project come to come to a completion. And it's just amazing. But thank you, Wendell, for sharing um, your projects and some of your insight. So now we're going to move on to um, Scott Wickler um, from Westling Associates, Westling Architects. So take it away, Scott. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Scott Winkler. I'm an architect at Westling. Uh, that's what I used to look like when I could get a haircut. Um, and I'm going to go through three projects and talk a little bit about sort of the role the preservation architect played in these or that I played in these as a preservation architect. Um, purposely chose three different size projects. And so we'll start with the smallest one. Aaron, if you can move forward. Um, so this is the East Edelboro Academy in downtown Edelboro, Massachusetts. It was constructed as a private school in the mid 1800s and then had been converted or, or used then by the public school system when they absorbed the private institution um, until the 1960s, I believe, and then they uh, used it as office space. Um, and so this is owned by the city of Attleboro still. Uh, next slide. And it is um, maintained by the local historical society um, as well as the mission. And so this is more of a residential size building. You can see it's relatively small, it's all wood framed. Uh, and the local historical society had done a fair bit of work on it themselves. They had replaced the roof. Uh, they had redone some of the siding uh, and repainted it. Uh, and that's what it looked like. That's what it looks like today. Um, we got involved to help with uh, a couple of things. They were looking to get some grants for some additional preservation work. Um, they had also taken off non-historic uh, wood paneling inside on the first floor and were looking for help determining what they should be doing as they look to restore that back to its original configuration uh, and use it as a meeting space. So we helped with some programming and planning uh, as well as some grants for they needed to, they still need to restore the windows, which are not original. Um, and uh, next slide. And, and this front porch, they had done some work on the front porch, which is actually a roof over the basement, uh, but there's some problems with it. it. It started buckling right away. So we'll be going in and redoing that. Um, also these columns, uh, these Doric columns, they traditionally had no bases on them. And so as they rotted out over time, they would cut the wood back and put wood blocks on them. So as they continue to rot, we'll actually be re reworking those, redetailing them and trying to restore the original bottoms. Um, but I think, what I wanted to touch on here is sort of these buildings all were built for a purpose, um, these historic buildings that often is no longer needed or needs to be modified. Um, even churches change the way they do church these days, and you'll see a church in a minute. Um, so one of the roles of a preservation architect is to go in and help figure out how to use this historic structure for a new use or a modified use. 
and do it in a way that doesn't ruin the building, right? We can, it's really easy to take a building and divide it up into apartments, but it's really hard to do it and not destroy the historic character. So I think the preservation architect is there to help envision a new use that allows the building to be saved and do it in a way that doesn't ruin the building's historic character. So here they're looking to turn this into meeting space. Uh, we certainly document the building. Uh, we look to record all the original trims and moldings um, and put together a good set of existing drawings. Um, we also look to investigate missing parts and pieces. Uh, next slide. So this is the inside of the building. Uh, on the right, you see the first floor. Again, they had removed paneling. Um, and what they have uncovered is the original structure um, that needs to then be re reclad with um, what we've, you know, they saved the, um, they actually had the whiplash, so they saved the old whiplash and we'll be going in with historic plaster. Um, but what they uncovered, uh, it's a little hard to see in this picture, the windows, which we're looking to have new sash made, but the frames are original. And um, when they put the paneling in, they removed historic trim and, and cut the, the wood stools down. So we'll be actually, we found enough evidence in the building to be able to replicate that trim and, and restore the stools. Um, in the middle of this picture is a column. It's actually an eight-sided wood column that's original uh, to the building, but one of the two of those columns was, was cut in half, shaved down to make room for new partition. So we have to go in and repair that, things like that. Um, the historical group was, um, if you look closely at the structure above, that's the second floor framing, and it was determined by actually two different engineers. Um, a previous one and one that I worked with that is not adequate to support any kind of use of the second floor. Um, so the historical group was thinking of maybe putting those steel beams in, uh, but when I got involved, I actually convinced them that we, we could do it in a more historically sensitive way. So instead of having these steel beams hanging or sitting in the ceiling plane below that framing, we're going to be able to pocket in something that retains all the original material and just adds a simple um, metal plate intervention um, to give it the strength it needs without destroying the character. Uh, on the left is actually one of the stairwells, the stairwell to the second floor, and, and part of the investigation is looking and finding there actually be, used to be two of these stairwells. There was a, a, a there were two classrooms upstairs, and they each had their own stairwell, um, and they, one of them is missing, and we're on the fence about whether to recreate that, um, but we have the evidence to show that, and, and what's interesting about this photo is you're seeing some of the paneling on the left. You're seeing an original horizontal board wood um, finish in the rooms. This, this guardrail um, they thought was not original, but actually in looking at it closer, the top rail's original. Um, there's actually on the bottom, there's wood that was put in to cover the original baluster holes. The two, the next two horizontal rails were, um, were added. And then the bottom, they put a new wood floor down that covers up where the original baluster holes are in the original wood floor. So um, again, this investigation at a finer level of detail on these small properties to be able to find evidence of missing parts and pieces and be able to recreate that in a historically appropriate way on a building that's really not getting modified much, um, but certainly needs to have a lot of historic character as a home for the historical society and the historical commission. Um, so that's some of the work we do is to help find that evidence and, and figure out how to put it back to that use. Um, next, next slide. Uh, another project, a little bit larger, I'm working on in uh, in Central Square in Cambridge is First Baptist Church, a beautiful historic red brick church uh, with uh, brownstone and architectural terracotta accents. Um, from a distance, it's 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 quite an impressive structure, really imposing in the in the center of Central Square. Um, but when you get up close to it, it, actually has a lot of issues. We're helping them work through a lot of um, deferred maintenance. Um, and next slide. This uh, this is actually the inside. So left, you're seeing sanctuary. You start to see the, 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 the problems of these historic buildings when they, we, they're not maintained. We get the moisture through the wall, uh, plaster on the left falling off the wall. Um, luckily, the building is almost entirely intact. We have all the original materials, so there's not a lot of investigation about what's missing, but there's a lot of investigation about why is it deteriorating? What is the problem? On the right, I'm taking a moisture reading of the masonry wall where it had been exposed in the past because the plaster had fallen off of it. It was so, it was so deteriorated. So understanding what's causing this damage and being able to fix that and stop the damage as they go to look to restore the building. Uh, next slide. Uh, on the left is the fellowship hall. Again, beautiful woodwork. Every window in the building inside and out is stained glass. Um, so what I love about the picture on the left, I just, you know, a little side note, all of those windows on the first floor are actually triple hung, meaning that the wood panel below the windows is, is built like a sash 
and it raises up along with the bottom sash and actually creates a full opening. So it's like a movable partition. They can expand this room by lifting up those historic windows. So uh, appreciating that history and, and making it work for their new use, but keeping all that original uh, uh, detail and restoring it. On the right are a couple of the historic exterior windows, and you know those are two good examples of what we have. We have a range of conditions, actually a couple worse than this, but the one on the right, the top sash, it's a little hard to see, but it's Boeing, uh, and that's a common problem with stained glass, and understanding what caused that and what we need to do to restore or repair those. Um, it turns out that of these four sash, we're going to have to remove and replace, uh, remove and rebuild the glass of one of those, the top right. Uh, the others will be able to reinforce and, and maintain in place. Uh, luckily, the window sash are in generally good condition. But again, that's part of our evaluation. What do we have? What kind of shape is it in? What do we have to do to keep it and not remove it and have to replace it? Uh, next slide. Uh, on the left, now on the outside, we do a full evaluation of these buildings. What are, what are the conditions? Again, what's causing this problem? So looking at the picture on the left, um, again, you see these brownstone blocks on the piers. And if you look closely, you'll see some missing bricks there. And then moving to the right, you'll see a window uh, where the sash, uh, the sill is rotted out. So we have a lot of rotted sills, a common problem. Um, the sash and the frames look bad, but they're mostly just peeling paint. So again, we're prodding the wood. We're determining the condition. Uh, we're figuring out what do we have? How can we fix it? How can we replace what we need to and keep those elements? Uh, again, to the right up here with a lot of bricks. That's a lot of freeze thaw damage. It's moisture getting in the wall and pushing those bricks out. Um, and then the picture on the right, uh, water getting in below those uh, architectural terracotta caps and, and coming out with efflorescence. So understanding the problems there, there it's actually a flashing problem um, and, and, a, and a problem with the flashing under the wall and where the wall meets the, the wall behind it. And so getting in there and fixing those problems. Um, next slide. Um, and again, this is a tall building, so we're up on a lift. We're looking at the conditions up above, the things you can't really see from the street, you, maybe with the binoculars, but a lot of times it's always best to get up up on these buildings as high as you can. Um, so you're able to really see the slate roof and de determine the condition of it, um, you know, and what we're missing and what we think the, the quality of what's remaining in its, in its lifespan. Um, and the tower you're seeing, we're actually up there near the tower and looking at some of the problems we had with the tower. On the right is another piece of the building, a pinnacle, that there's a piece of brownstone that's supporting it. It's hard to see, but that's spalled off. And so it's no longer supporting the brick, and the brick above is starting to, to peel off. So that's actually one of the more dangerous things that we had to address right away. So that's already been repaired. Um, we're, we're looking for those things. And, and I think one of the things about this project is phasing. Um, not every organization can afford to go in and do the project all at once. Um, and so helping them figure out the phasing, both the inside and getting them into the building to use it, but on the outside, um, what, what are the phasing of the restoration? They can't do the whole thing at once. Which pieces are keeping the building, need to be done first to keep the building dry, to stop that moisture intrusion, to keep things from falling off the building? And that's really the focus a lot of times on these projects is we have multiple phases of restoration work. Uh, next next uh, slide. And, th and that all results in, in these kind of drawings. So we're, we're documenting the building. A little hard to see at this scale, but there's, there's little patterns and numbers and a little chart on the right. That all relates to the problems we found. This was actually an existing conditions evaluation that we started the project off with. And from this, we, we can identify all the problems. We can start to develop project budgets. And we can work with the owner and figure out, and, and with contractors, and figure out which pieces they can afford to do. And, and we can help direct them to doing the, the right things first. Uh, and avoid sort of respending money later to do other pieces. And so we actually just did our first phase of, of extra restoration there at the end of last year. Um, next slide. Um, last project, again, a little bigger. Um, doesn't look that large from the pictures, but it's bigger than it looks. This is the Lord Jeffrey Inn in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, great historic uh, inn built in 1926. Um, and it was built just like it looks. It was built to look like a rambling set of uh, New England buildings with additions added on to them. But that's the original construction. So as this thing steps down the hill, um, all the way on the left, you see what's called the east wing. And that's a half level off from the main building up front. And so that was a big problem, and especially these days. So one of the things we deal with on these historic buildings is, is accessibility. Um, they were built in a time when they just didn't care about that. That wasn't a concern, and now it really is. So we have to, to maintain these buildings and use them, we have to make them accessible. Uh, we often have to bring in new services. They need heating and air conditioning. They, they, they didn't have air conditioning. 
Um, they need a certain level of, um, this is a hotel still, so they need data, they need internet, they need all these things that these buildings weren't designed to house. Um, and so figuring out how to put those into a historic building and not ruin the character of the building is another thing a preservation architect does. Uh, the, what's great about this building, it was actually built by Amherst College and they had an amazing archive of, of original photos like you see on the left of original drawings. Uh, they actually have construction photos when it was being constructed. So we were able to learn some things that you couldn't tell from the, just looking at it. It turns out that most of this building is wood framed with brick veneer. Uh, you would have guessed it's a load bearing masonry building, but we did, you know, with, with that, we were able to focus our investigation of, of where the problems were happening and, and open up specific parts of the, of the masonry wall to, to understand the problems and how to address them. Um, but that little photo on the left showed us another thing that that, that little bit of white um, haziness on the brick that people kind of liked um, was originally all whitewashed. The entire building was white. And so, next slide. As part of restoring it, we actually went back and put the whitewash on. We didn't whitewash it quite as well as it was originally. The, the people in town loved the, the modeled nature of it, so we did a little less whitewash, but, but we put that back on. And um, one of the things you're seeing here is an inaccessible entrance. The front entrance there where the flag is the original stairs are there, but we are able to create a grade change um, on the right there where you're walking off the sidewalk and up that brick paved walkway and entering that same front door, but with accessibility and without having a big ramp on the front of the building. So those are the things that are a preservation architect can really help um, bring that modernization of the building that's often needed in a way that's historically sensitive. Um, next slide. And this is the view from the back. So on the right is that east wing. And uh, originally we were hired to help them renovate the building and tear that down uh, and put a new east wing on that would have had a similar character as well as other rooms um, beyond that and expanded the hotel and made it all at the same level and put in a ballroom and all those sorts of things. And the project, uh, we actually went through a design process with them on that and it was too expensive. And they weren't sure what to do. And we actually suggested they reconsider how they're approaching the project and use historic tax credit. So this became a tax credit project. And what that allowed us to do was really keep that historic character, um, be creative. There's an elevator that you might pick out in this picture that has to be placed just in the right spot where it, it meets those two different floor levels and allows the building to be fully accessible. Um, and of course it's on the backside where you're not seeing it from the street. And then they needed that ballroom they were going to build. And so we built that ballroom here in a courtyard that used to, um, historically, or in the last 40 years, they had had a, a tent structure there as their outdoor um, ballroom, essentially. And so we created a permanent building that, you know, matched the character of the original building. Uh, the roof of that actually meets the first floor of the, of the inn, uh, such that you can walk out on that roof deck and uh, there's a green roof on top of it. So that's the piece you're seeing, that one story piece on the left. So that's new construction. Uh, again, all done to meet sort of historic standards, um, give them the functionality they needed to continue to run the building, and then restoring what we had of the original building. As a little side note, the front corner room of the East Wing that you can see that's closest to you is known as the um, Robert Frost room. Robert Frost lived there for many years uh, when he was in town as a teacher at Amherst and, uh, and actually wrote some of his stories from there. So that's a really important room that they almost lost because of um, not being sure how to make it accessible. Uh, next slide. Just a couple more pictures of this. Um, again, the, the historic information is really so important on these buildings. We had, the bottom left is a picture, a before picture of this room that was had been used as part of a restaurant. But the original drawing showed that it had a glass ceiling. It actually, um, and we, so we, we said, well, let's restore that. We found remnants of it when we removed the, the ceiling. And what you're seeing on the right is the restored glass ceiling. So that's actually um, now a private dining room off the restaurant. But Again, knowing that that was there before we started construction allowed us to propose keeping that and, and maintaining it. So it's always great if you're an organization to try and find old drawings, try and find old photographs. Those are so valuable to your, your architecture team. Uh, next slide. And last slide, I believe. And so just a couple more pictures of, of the end, the restored rooms. And again, the, the, the goal of these projects is to keep that historic character. Um, you're seeing a, 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 a typical sort of a quirky bedroom on the left that this room has, this building has. And then the lobby on the right with restored front desk, um, original and all that. But the, um, the key again, there's, there's all sorts of services in this building. There's, there's new mechanical systems, there's new sprinkler systems, there's um, new electrical systems and being able to integrate that into the building without losing that historic character that a building like this has is a thing that this preservation architect should be really good at. And that's what 
one of the things I think we try to bring to a building is allowing them to live a new life and have a new youth and, and, and integrating those things that are needed to make that happen. So I'll close on that. Scott, thank you so very much. And um, thank you also again to, uh, to Bob and, and Wendell. Um, I think this is, um, you know, this has been such a very helpful and insightful um, conversation. And I, um, I think it's, um, you know, the idea and um, the takeaway is, um, you know, trying to find um, a, a new life for these uh, historic buildings, which are, are such important parts of our cities and towns and neighborhoods. Um, and also trying to dispel some of the myths that just because the structure is old doesn't mean you can you can't have updated systems and you can't um, give it a new life or a new use. Um, I think it's something, and again, it's a little bit preaching to the choir because everybody on here um, is very, you know, everybody on here, you know, knows and understands and appreciates historic preservation. But um, I think when looking at historic, you know, buildings, trying to convey the message and show that it's possible to give um, these um, you know, historic buildings, you know, new life and new uses. Um, so thank you again so very much. Um, and we have a couple of questions if you guys have, and we still have plenty of time. So um, we actually have a question that was submitted um, via email. Um, and it actually has to do, um, it's a, actually has to do with um, the state of preservation um, architecture education. Um, this uh, this e email came to us from someone who couldn't be with us today, um, but wanted to get um, you know your collective take on the state of preservation architecture education, uh, which institutions are doing it deliberately and doing it well, and um, and are your firms uh, fostering um, a group of young preservation-minded architects, you know, working with the next you know generation of preservation architects. So I'll just kind of open it up to um, so Bob Wendell Scott, feel free to chime in about um, preservation architecture education. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I can start with that. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's several different uh, methods of, of, of building the knowledge you need as a preservation architect, from very formal to the more practical. Certainly, there's some very good formal academic institutions such as Columbia University and uh, Penn that have world standard programs for, for historic preservation uh, tied to architectural programs as well as preservation law and preservation planning. And those, those are great resources um, for those that have the means to, to do them. Um, my, my path was much more practical. I, I got most of my preservation, preservation education hands-on, having a passion for it and, and making sure that I worked within environments where that was the concentration of the types of buildings I was working on. And it was learning from uh, mentors and peers, um, attending conferences by organizations like the Association for Preservation Technology, a lot of reading and, and a lot of trial and error. and, and Learning to respect and, and listen to craft people. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing process. Not all these projects are almost always unique, and so every single project you, you're forced to have to learn new things. It's the stuff you haven't dealt with before. Marty, what do you want to say? Okay. Um, thanks, Bob. Um, thank, thank you, Bob. Um, this um, the question actually came from Kathy Cotteridis with Historic Boston Incorporated, um, and I know probably all of our um, speakers uh, know Kathy um, and Historic Boston really well. And you know they are an organization that does um, that does projects, and they employ um, they employ architects. And she said she was sometimes uh, she's often struck by the lack of preservation um, training and sensitivity in young architects, and perhaps it's not you know, um, the, your firms um, and, you know, you as architects, you obviously, you know, you specialize in historic preservation, but I think, um, you know, generally, um, you know, kind of almost wondering, do you think it should be, um, should there be, is there any focus or there should be, a, should there be a focus on historic, um, on historic uh, architecture and preservation without having some sort of specialization in historic building construction or materials, but should it be part of a, uh, a broader architectural education. Um, I'm just trying to get I'll at the form of Kathy's yeah, question. Yeah. So. This is um, I guess this is Wendell Kelso. 
I, I think it's there's an academic component to preservation as well as a very important hands-on component as kind of Bob had mentioned um, earlier and I think what's also very important for owners um, whether they're nonprofits like Historic Boston or or educational institutions or municipalities is to carefully look at the firms that are engaged because I think just like medicine architecture is a is a fairly specialized um, profession um, and so that the uh, I think firms and young people that work for preservation yeah, firms that need to have that preservation background and philosophy um, it's pretty hard to expect sensitivity uh, especially from young architects um, if this is the first preservation so I had my wife looking this morning. So she looks and looks. It's okay. Well, I'm going to look. I'm sorry, Wendell. Yeah, I'm sorry, but <laughs> sorry. I, I think it's one component is the sensitivity in terms of individuals working on the project. So I think the a, a key element is to identify firms that do preservation work, um, kind of day in and day out. And so that you're not going to get somebody who's it's the first historic project they're working on or the second historic project that they're working on, but they have a a track record of some time period um, because I think that's where the sensitivity comes from is is that experience of working on historic buildings, um, seeing what's unique about your project and seeing the best way to address it in a in a in a sensitive way. Thank you, Wendell Scott. I think you'd wanted to chime in too. No, I think Wendell, Wendell had it. You know, it was good. The um, exactly. I, I I think he said most of what I was going to say. So I'll, I'll like leave it at that and move on. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, I know we're we're very <clears throat> you know here in Massachusetts we're very you know lucky to have you know a number of firms that do specialize in um in um with historic specialized in focusing on historic buildings and preservation focused architecture and those are the ones we tend to refer um those are the ones we tend to refer people to but um you know i you're right wendell you know it's a very um like bob said it's very hands-on preservation is very hands-on and each building and situation is um so unique so it um but um great wonderful so um we have another question um Let's see, this is from, uh, do the speakers have any examples where the building code offered challenges to a re rehabilitation, but you were able to find a solution that met the needs of the code and allowed a sensitive rehabilitation to progress? So any building code challenges that you have run into? I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, along with preservation, I actually involved in the, the codes committee at the, at the Boston Society of Architects. And so... Yeah, unfortunately, it's like almost every one of them. Um, but the, uh, you know, I think part of it's knowing that the code, there's more than one code and knowing how to manipulate or use the codes in using the right code. Um, there are existing building codes and there are some special things for historic buildings. But even within that, there's always challenges. Um, it, accessibility is a big one. I touched on it in, in Amherst, um, the uh, just half level off and half the rooms were back there. Um, and so, a lot, you know, working through that, um, having to get variances sometimes from the, the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board um, for things that you can't make meet the letter of the code, um, and working with, you know, working with building officials. But there's, there's definitely, I think every one of these projects, at least that I've involved with, has something, some kind of challenge, and, you know, trying to do it in a way that you know, a lot of times there's multiple four buildings, like the first one I showed that's tiny. They can't do an elevator. They're never going to make that accessible. So for them, that means programming it in a way that second floor does not have spaces that need to be accessible. Um, and that's that's one of the challenges sometimes of a historic building is, is making sure the use is, is integrated into it in a way that allows it to meet code without having to just building, like putting a big elevator on a tiny building. And I think one thing that Scott referred to is, you know, we're I think we're very fortunate in Massachusetts to have the Architectural Access Board, 
um, so that, you know, yes, the code is written at basically thinking of new construction, but they are a very um, receptive board in terms of hearing specific conditions of buildings. And so that they realize that there's a middle ground on historic buildings where you balance historic character and accessibility. So that if you're creative and finding a solution, um, they have been very receptive in terms of, you know, what's an appropriate variance for this particular project. And so um, I think that's one place where Massachusetts is, um, because of our requirements, have much better accessibility in our historic buildings and also allow unique um, variations from project to project. So uh, I think the Access Board in particular is very good and local building officials are also very good in terms of um, helping to address unique situations on projects. There's a lot of technology. Even I've worked on some historic theaters, and and there's some great technology in terms of smoke detection and other things that you just didn't have 20 years ago that are able to um, often make them safe without having to do certain things. Um, and just you know better sprinkler systems, ways of, of there continue to be ways of hiding some of the modern devices that we need uh, to make buildings safe or meet code. Um, and I think that helps too. That technology continues to I think help us out with some of that. I mean, I, I found that collaborating with building officials and, and access review groups, as well as fire marshals, as an architect, if you can come in and show the limitations that the building has that um, would require a, a destructive treatment to the historic fabric and put something on the table that makes the condition better and safer and more accessible than it was prior to the project and, and sort of demonstrate good faith on trying to meet the intent of the code, why not satisfying the letter of it? Um, that's usually a very successful approach. Not always, but often. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we just have uh, one more question. I know we're kind of getting to the end here, but um, <clears throat> As um, you know, Scott mentioned uh, uh, for the Lord Jeffrey Inn project, historic tax credits and having suggested them to Amherst College. Um, I guess to all of you, to what extent do each of you see your involvement in projects expanding beyond just um, architecture and engineering into um, you know, financing and even envisioning the, uh, the project as a whole? So um, you know, do you see your role expanding just beyond, you know, preservation architecture and into kind of being more of a collaborative team player and you're involved in a lot more decisions that people may not necessarily think you're involved with? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll jump in first if you don't mind. Yeah, the, I, my, the firm I worked for for a number of years in, in Providence, who was actually on the last slide, Newport Collaborative, we actually did a lot of the tax credit applications in-house. They don't do that anymore, but at the time, um, it, it gave us a really hand, the ability to research and, and figure all that stuff out. And so we had a lot of projects that, that relied on the, the tax credits to be feasible. And at the time, Rhode Island had a very lucrative state credit on top of the federal credit. And so we did. We, we I knew an awful lot. I still do. But it, it, even back then, especially about the tax credit law and and, and the application process and, and helping projects find funds, um, not just through that, but through some other new market credits and and city and state grants and all sorts of sources that are out there or could be out there. Uh, and I think, yeah, we're, you know, we're often the, the first project I showed where we were brought in to help them figure out if they could get a grant. And um, there's got a few of those where we're helping them try to get grant funding um, to make the project happen. I mean, project promotion is extensive. As Scott mentioned, assistance with, with developing grants and tax credits. Um, and funding sources and meeting with donors is a big part of it. But it's also leading community meetings so that people understand the importance of the building and, and what the needs are and why a project's important. Um, project promotion, it's, it's, there's a whole level of cheerleading and promotion and building excitement around these historic sites to generate an atmosphere where people want to support them. And that's, that's a very big part of, of what preservation architects bring to, to the table. Yeah. 
Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I mean, it's um, it's quite obvious that you know preservation isn't black and white. Um, it's varying shades of gray. And um, I think we learned um, last week when we were speaking with some preservation consultants, um, they're involved um, in a lot more areas of you know preservation projects than than we initially think and appreciate. And the same thing with preservation architects. You your role is not just um, you know to your your role is not just that of an architect, it's, you know, it's so multifaceted. And I think one thing we keep seeing over and over again during these conversations is that preservation, it's, it's collaborative and um, it is so multifaceted and it's not just, you know, it's not just one thing. You're working with a whole team of so many different people, different stakeholders. Um, and that's really what makes preservation, um, preservation function, being part of a team, being collaborative and being, you know, open and, you know, flexible and, um, but also having, you know, the, the end goal of having a historic resource that you want to um, have, you know, continued use, a new life, um, and make sure it's going to be around to endure and serve its community for the next, you know, several decades or the next, you know, hundred years. So, um, I would just like to give a huge, huge thank you to Bob Score, to Wendell Calso, and Scott Winkler for joining us today, for putting their presentations together, and giving us a little glimpse behind the curtain of what a preservation architect does. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Um, we're very lucky to have them on our board of directors, and thank you very much for answering the call when I emailed you asking you to be a part of this. So. Um, and this is our last preservation month, preservation conversation, but fear not, we are going to be back next week. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation about um, preservation grants with uh, the Mass Historic Grant staff. Um, but if you have any uh, thoughts or suggestions, I think somebody today had a question about um, historic residential architecture, and I think they're interested in possibly having that as a future conversation topic, so that may be coming your way soon. Uh, if you have any suggestions or comments, please uh, feel free to email myself or also email Chris Skelly um, at the Mass Historic Commission. Um, Chris, as you know, does a lot of uh, workshops and um, presentations and educational material for historic commissions around the state, so if you have any thoughts about workshop needs, um, email one of us, both of us. Uh, we're here. Um, and as I said, we have another preservation conversation coming um, next uh, next Wednesday, June 3rd. Uh, we'll have information going out about that uh, shortly. And, um, and uh, so just thank you once again for taking the time to join us either live and in person, or if you're watching this on YouTube or on Preservation Mass's website. Um, all of our, if you have questions, uh, feel free to connect with Preservation Massachusetts. Um, we'll have a, an amended schedule for future preservation conversations um, that will be up on the website soon. We may have a little bit of an amended schedule and it may not be happening every week throughout the summer, uh, but as things start to pick back up and people return to some sense of normalcy, I do think we still want to keep these conversations going. The information has been valuable and we've been so very lucky to have everybody join us that we've had. So once again, Bob, Scott, Wendell, thank you so very much. Thank you everybody for being on. Thank you to the PM staff for being on. And we hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we will talk to you next week. Thank you very much, everyone.